Outliers, Chapter 3, The Trouble with Geniuses, Part 1. Knowledge of a boy's IQ is of little help if you are faced with a form full of clever boys. In the fifth episode of the 2008 season, the American television quiz show One vs. 100 had as its special guest a man named Christopher Langan. The television show One vs. 100 is one of many that sprang up in the wake of the phenomenal success of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. It features a permanent gallery of 100 ordinary people who serve as what is called the mob. Each week, they, wa- they match wits with a special invited guest. At stake is a million dollars. The guest has to be smart enough to answer more questions correctly than his or her 100 adversaries. And by that standard, few have ever seemed as superbly qualified as Christopher Lincoln. Tonight, the mob takes on their fiercest competition yet, the voiceover began. Meet Chris Langan, who many call the smartest man in America. The camera did a slow pan of a stocky, muscular man in his 50s. The average person has an IQ of 100, the voiceover continued. Einstein, 150. Chris has an IQ of 195. He's currently wrapping his big brain around a theory of the universe, But will his king-size cranium be enough to take down the mob for $1 million? Find out right now on 1 vs. 100. Out strode Langan onto the stage amid wild applause. You don't think you need to have a high intellect to do well on 1 vs. 100, do you? The show's host, Bob Saget, asked him. Saget looked at Langan oddly, as if he were some kind of laboratory specimen. Actually, I think it could be a hindrance, Langan replied. He had a deep, certain voice. To have a high IQ, you tend to specialize, think deep thoughts. You avoid trivia. But now that I see these people, he glanced at the mob, the amusement in his eyes betraying just how ridiculous he found the proceedings, I think I'll do okay. Over the past decade, Chris Lingen has achieved a strange kind of fame. He has become the public face of genius in American life, a celebrity outlier. He gets invited on news shows and profiled in magazines, and he has been the subject of a documentary by the filmmaker Errol Morris, all because of a brain that appears to defy description. The television television news show 2020 once hired a neuropsychologist to give Langan an IQ test, and Langan's score was literally off the charts, too high to be accurately measured. Another time, Langan took an IQ test specially designed for people too smart for ordinary IQ tests. He got all the questions right except one. He was speaking at six six months of age. When he was three, he would listen to the radio on Sundays as the announcer read the comics aloud, and he would follow along on his own until he had taught himself to read. At five, he began questioning his grandfather about the existence of God and remembers being disappointed in the answers he got. In school, Langan could walk into a test in a foreign language class, not having studied at all, and if there were two or three minutes before the instructor arrived, he could skim through the textbook and ace the test. In his early teenage years, while working as a farmhand, he started to read widely in the area of theoretical physics. At 16, he made his way through Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead's famously abstruse masterpiece, Principia Mathematica. He got a perfect score on his SAT, even though he fell asleep at one point during the test. He did math for an hour, his brother Mark says of Langan's summer routine in high school. Then he did French for an hour. Then he studied Russian. Then he would read philosophy. He did that religiously every day. Another of his brothers, Jeff, says, You know, when Christopher was 14 or 15, he would draw things just as a joke, and it would be like a photograph. When he was 15, he could match Jimi Hendrix lick for lick on a guitar. Boom, boom, boom. Half the time, Christopher didn't attend school at all. He would just show up for tests, and there was nothing they could do about it. To us, it was hilarious. He could brief a semester's worth of textbooks in two days and take care of whatever he had to take care of and then get back to whatever he was doing in the first place. On the set of One Versus 100, Langan was poised and confident. His voice was deep. His eyes were small and fiercely bright. He did not circle about topics, searching for the right phrase, or double back to restate a previous sentence. For that matter, he did not say um or ah or use any form of conversational mitigation. His sentences came marching out one after another, polished and crisp, like soldiers on a parade. Every question Saget threw at him, he tossed aside as if it were a triviality. When his winnings reached $250,000, he appeared to make a mental calculation that the risks of losing everything were at that point greater than the potential benefits of staying in.
Abruptly, he stopped. I'll take the cash, he said. He shook Saget's hand firmly and was finished, exiting on top as we like to think geniuses invariably do. Just after the First World War, Lewis Terman, a young professor of psychology at Stanford University, met a remarkable boy named Henry Cowell. Cowell had been raised in poverty and chaos. Because he did not get along with other children, he had been unschooled since the age of seven. He worked as a janitor at a one-room schoolhouse not far from the Stanford campus, and throughout the day, Cowell would sneak away from his job and play the school piano, and the music he made was beautiful. Terman's specialty was intelligence testing, the standard IQ test that millions of people around the world would take during the following 50 years, the Stanford Binet, was his creation. So he decided to test Cal's IQ. The boy must be intelligent, he reasoned, and sure enough, he was. He had an IQ of above 140, which is near genius level. Terman was fascinated. How many other diamonds in the rough were there, he wondered. He began to look for others. He found a girl who knew the alphabet at 19 months and another who was reading Dickens and Shakespeare by the time she was four. He found a young man who had been kicked out of law school because his professors did not believe that it was possible for a human being to precisely reproduce long passages of legal opinions from memory. In 1921, Terman decided to make the study of the gifted his life work. Armed with a large grant from the Commonwealth Foundation, he put together a team of field workers and sent them out into California's elementary schools. Teachers were asked to nominate the brightest students in their classes. Those children were given an intelligence test. The students who scored in the top 10% were then given a second IQ test, and those who scored above 130 on that test were given a third IQ test. And from that set of results, Terman selected the best and the brightest. By the time Terman was finished, he had sorted through the records of some 250,000 elementary and high school students and identified 1,470 children whose IQs averaged over 140 and ranged as high as 200. That group of young geniuses came to be known as the termites, and they were the subjects of what would become one of the most famous psychological studies in history. For the rest of his life, Terman watched over his charges like a mother hen. They were tracked and tested, measured and analyzed. Their educational attainments were noted, marriages followed, illnesses tabulated, psychological health charted, and every promotion and job change dutifully recorded. Terman wrote his recruits letters of recommendation for jobs and graduate school applications. He doled out a constant stream of, stream of advice and counsel, all the time recording his findings in thick red volumes entitled Genetic Studies of Geniuses. There is nothing about an individual as important as his IQ, except possibly his morals, Terman once said. And it was to those with a very high IQ, he believed, that we must look for production of leaders who advance science, art, government, education, and so social welfare generally. As his subjects grew older, Terman issued updates on their progress, chronicling their extraordinary achievements. It is almost impossible, Terman wrote giddily when his charges were in high school, to read a newspaper account of any sort of competition or activity in which California boys and girls participate without finding among the winners the names of one or more members of our gifted group. He took writing samples from some of his most artistically minded subjects and had literary critics compare them to the early writings of famous authors. They could find no difference. All the signs pointed, he said, to a group with the potential for heroic stature. Terman believed that his termites were destined to be the future elite of the United States. Today, many of Terman's ideas remain central to the way we think about success. Schools have programs for the gifted. Elite universities often require that students take an intelligence test, such as the American Scholastic Aptitude Test, for admission. High-tech companies like Google or Microsoft carefully measure the cognitive abilities of prospective employees out of the same belief. They are convinced that those at the very top of the IQ scale have the greatest potential. At Microsoft, famously, job applicants are asked a battery of questions designed to test their smarts, including the classic, why are manhole covers round? If you don't know the answer to that question, you're not smart enough to work at Microsoft. If I had magical powers and offered to raise your IQ by 30 points, you'd say yes, right? You'd assume that would help you get further ahead in the world. And when we hear about someone like Chris Langan, our instinctive response is the same as Terman's instinctive response when he met Henry Cowell almost a century ago. We feel awe. Geniuses are the ultimate outliers. Surely there is nothing that can hold someone like that back. But is that true? 
So far in Outliers, we have seen that extraordinary achievement is less about talent than it is about opportunity. In this chapter, I want to try to dig deeper into why. That's the case by looking at the outlier in its purest and most distilled form, the genius. For years, we've taken our cues from people like Terman when it comes to understanding the significance of high intelligence. But as we shall see, Terman made an error. He was wrong about his termites. And had he happened on the young Chris Langan working his way through Principia Mathematica at the age of 16, he would have been wrong about him for the same reason. Terman didn't understand what a real outlier was. And that's a mistake. A mistake we continue to make to this day. One of the most widely used intelligence tests is something called Raven's Progressive Matrices. It requires no language skills or a specific body of acquired knowledge. It's a measure of abstract reasoning skills. A typical Raven's test consists of 48 items, each one harder than the one before it, and IQ is calculated based on how many items are answered correctly. Here's a typical question of the sort that is asked on the Raven's. Did you get that? I'm guessing most of you did. The correct answer is C, but now try this one. It's the kind of really hard question that comes at the end of the Ravens. The correct answer is A. I have to confess I couldn't figure this one out, and I'm guessing most of you couldn't either. Chris Langan almost certainly could, however. When we say that people like Langan are really brilliant, what we mean is that they have the kind of mind that can figure out puzzles like that last question. Over the years, an enormous amount of research has been done in an attempt to determine how a person's performance on an IQ test like the Ravens translates to real life success. People at the bottom of the scale with an IQ below 70 are considered mentally disabled. A score of 100 is average. You probably need to be just above that mark to be able to handle college. To get into and succeed in a reasonably competitive graduate program, meanwhile, you probably need an IQ of at least 115. In general, the higher your score, the more education you'll get, the more money you're likely to make, and believe it or not, the longer you'll live. But there's a catch. The relationship between success and IQ works only up to a point. Once someone has reached an IQ of somewhere around 120, having additional IQ points doesn't seem to translate into any measurable real-world advantage. It is amply proved that someone with an IQ of 170 is more likely to think well than someone whose IQ is 70, the British psychologist Liam Hudson has written. And this holds true where the comparison is much closer, between IQs of, say, 100 and 130. But the relation seems to break down when one is making comparisons between two people, both of whom have high IQs, which are relatively high. A mature scientist with an adult IQ of 130 is as likely to win a Nobel Prize as is one whose IQ is 180. What Hudson is saying is that IQ is a lot like height in basketball. Does someone who is five foot six have a realistic chance of playing professional basketball? Not really. You need to be at least six foot or six one to play at that level. And all things being equal, it's probably better to be six two than six one and better to be six three than six two. But past a certain point, height stops mattering so much. A player who is six foot eight is not automatically better than someone who is two inches shorter. Michael Jordan, the greatest player ever, was six six after all. A basketball player only has to be tall enough, and the same is true of intelligence. Intelligence has a threshold. The introduction to the one versus one hundred episode pointed out that Einstein had an IQ of one fifty, and Langan has an IQ of one ninety five. Langan's IQ is 30% higher than Einstein's, but that doesn't mean Langan is 30% smarter than Einstein. That's ridiculous. All we can say is that when it comes to thinking about really hard things like physics, they are both clearly smart enough. The idea that IQ has a threshold, I realize, goes against our intuition. We think that, say, Nobel Prize winners in science must have the highest IQ scores imaginable, that they must be the kinds of people who get perfect scores on their entrance examinations to college won every scholarship available, and had such stellar academic records in high school that they were scooped up by the top universities in the country. But take a look at the following list where the last 25 Americans to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine got their undergraduate degrees starting in 2007. Antioch College, Brown University, UC Berkeley, University of Washington, Columbia University, Case Institute of Technology, MIT, Caltech, Harvard University, Hamilton College, Columbia University, University of North Carolina, DePaul University, University of Pennsylvania, 
University of Minnesota, University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Johns Hopkins University, Yale University, Union College, Kentucky, University of Illinois, University of Texas, Holy Cross, Amherst College, Gettysburg College, Hunter College. <clears throat> no one would say that this list represents the college choices of the absolute best high school students in America. Yale and Columbia and MIT are on the list, but so are DePaul, Holy Cross, and Gettysburg College. It's a list of good schools. Along the same lines, here are the colleges of the last 25 American Nobel laureates in chemistry. I'll let you just scroll through here. To be a Nobel Prize winner, apparently, you have to be smart enough to get into a college at least as good as Notre Dame or the University of Illinois. That's all. This is a radical idea, isn't it? Suppose that your teenage daughter found out that she had been accepted at two universities, Harvard University and Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Where would you want her to go? I'm guessing Harvard because Harvard is a better school. Its students score a good 10 to 15 percent higher on their entrance exams. But given what we are learning about intelligence, the idea that schools can be ranked like runners in a race makes no sense. Georgetown students may not be as smart on an absolute scale as the students of Harvard, but they are all clearly smart enough. And future Nobel Prize winners come from schools like Georgetown, as well as from schools like Harvard. The psychologist Barry Schwartz recently proposed that elite schools give up their complex admissions process and simply hold a lottery for everyone above the threshold. Put people into two categories, Schwartz says, good enough and not good enough. The ones who are good enough to get in get put into a hat, and those who are not good enough get rejected. Schwartz concedes that his idea has virtually no chance of being accepted, but he's absolutely right. As Hudson writes, and keep in mind that he did his research at elite all-male English boarding schools in the 1950s and 60s, knowledge of a boy's IQ is of little help if you are faced with a form full of clever boys. Let me give you an example of the threshold effect in action. The University of Michigan Law School, like many elite U.S. educational institutions, uses a policy of affirmative action when it comes to applicants from disadvantaged backgrounds. Around 10% of the students Michigan enrolls each fall are members of racial minorities, and if the law school did not significantly relax its entry requirements for those students, admitting them with lower undergraduate grades and lower standardized test scores than everyone else, it estimates that percentage would be less than 3%. Furthermore, if we compare the grades that the minority and non-minority students get in law school, we see that the white students do better. That's not surprising. If one group has higher undergraduate grades and test scores than the other, it's almost certainly going to have higher grades in law school as well. This is one reason that affirmative action programs are so controversial. In fact, an attack on the University of Michigan's affirmative action program recently went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. For many people, it is troubling that an elite educational institution lets in students who are less qualified than their peers. A few years ago, however, the University of Michigan decided to look closely at how the law school's minority students had fared after they graduated. How much money did they make? How far up the profession did they go? How satisfied were they with their careers? What kind of social and community contributions did they make? What kind of honors had they won? They looked at everything that could conceivably be an indication of real world success and what they found surprised them. We knew that our minority students, a lot of them were doing well, says Richard Lempert, one of the authors of the Michigan study. I think our expectation was that we would find a half or two thirds full glass, that they had not done as well as the white students, but nonetheless, a lot were quite successful. But we were completely surprised. We found that they were doing every bit as well. There was no place we saw any serious discrepancy. What Lempert is saying is that by the only measure that a law school really ought to care about, how well its graduates do in the real world, minority students aren't less qualified. They're just as successful as white students. And why? Because even though the academic credentials of minority students at Michigan aren't as good as those white students, the quality of students at the law school is high enough that they're still above the threshold. They are smart enough. Knowledge of a law student's test scores is of little help if you are faced with a classroom of clever law students. Let's take the threshold idea one step further. If intelligence matters only up to a point, then past that point, other things, things that have nothing to do with intelligence, must start to matter more. It's like basketball again. Once someone is tall enough, then we start to care about speed and court sense and agility, 
and ball handling skills and shooting touch. So what might some of those other things be? Well, suppose that instead of measuring your IQ, I gave you a totally different kind of test. Write down as many different uses that you can think of for the following objects, a brick and a blanket. This is an example of what's called a divergence test, as opposed to a test like the Ravens, which asks you to sort through a list of possibilities and converge on the right answer. It requires you to use your imagination and take your mind in as many different directions as possible. With a divergence test, obviously there isn't a single right answer. What the test giver is looking for are the number and the uniqueness of your responses. And what the test is measuring isn't analytical intelligence, but something profoundly different, something much closer to creativity. Divergence tests are every bit as challenging as convergence tests. Good afternoon, everyone. We want to wish good luck. Divergence tests are every bit as challenging as convergence tests. And if you don't believe that, I encourage you to pause and try the brick and blanket test right now. Here, for example, are answers to the uses of objects test collected by Liam Hudson from a student named Poole at a top British high school. Brick, to use in smash and grab raids, to help hold a house together, to use in a game of Russian roulette if you want to keep fit at the same time. Bricks at 10 paces, turn and throw, no evasive action allowed to hold either down on a bed tie, a, a brick at each corner, as a breaker of empty Coca-Cola bottles. Blanket, to use on a bed, as a cover for illicit sex in the woods, as a tent, to make smoke signals with, as a sail for a boat, cart, or sled, as a substitute for a towel, as a target for shooting practice for short-sighted people, as a thing to catch people jumping out of burning skyscrapers. It's not hard to read Poole's answers and get some sense of how his mind works. He's funny, he's a little subversive and libidinous, he has the flair for the dramatic. His mind leaps from violent imagery to sex to people jumping out of burning skyscrapers to very practical issues, such as how to get a duvet to stay on the bed. He gives us the impression that if we gave him another 10 minutes, he'd come up with another 20 uses. Now, for the sake of comparison, consider the answers of another student from Hudson's sample. His name is Florence. Hudson tells us that Florence is a prodigy with one of the highest IQs in the building. Brick, building things, throwing. Blanket, keeping warm, smothering fire, tying to trees and sleeping in as a hammock, improvised stretcher. Where's Florence's imagination? He identified the most common and most functional uses for bricks and blankets and simply stopped. Florence's IQ is higher than Poole's, but that means little since both students are above the threshold. What's more interesting is that Poole's mind can leap from violent imagery to sex to people jumping out of buildings without missing a beat, and Florence's mind can't. Now, which of these two students do you think is better suited to do the kind of brilliant imaginative work that wins Nobel Prizes? That's the second reason Nobel Prize winners come from Holy Cross as well as Harvard, because Harvard isn't selecting its students on the basis of how well they do on the uses of a brick test, and maybe uses of a brick is a better predictor of Nobel Prize ability. It's also the second reason Michigan Law School couldn't find a difference between its affirmative action graduates and the rest of its alumni. Being a successful lawyer is about a lot more than IQ. It involves having the kind of fertile mind that Poole had. And just because Michigan's minority students have lower scores on convergence tests doesn't mean they don't have that other critical trait in abundance. This was Terman's error. He fell in love with the fact that his termites were at the absolute pinnacle of the intellectual scale, at the 99th percentile of the 99th percentile, without realizing how little that seemingly extraordinary fact meant. By the time the termites reached adulthood, Terman's error was plain to see. Some of his child geniuses had grown up to publish books and scholarly articles and thrive in business. Several ran for public office and there were two superior court justices, one municipal court judge, two members of the California state legislature, and one prominent state official. But few of his geniuses... But few of his geniuses were nationally known figures. They tended to earn good incomes, but not that good. The majority had careers that could only be considered ordinary. And a surprising number ended up with careers that even Terman considered failures. Nor were there any Nobel Prize winners in his exhaustively selected group of geniuses. His field workers actually tested two elementary students who went on to be Nobel laureates, William Shockley and Luis Alvarez, and rejected them both. Their IQs weren't high enough. In a devastating critique, the sociologist Pitrium Sorokin 
once showed that if Terman had simply put together a randomly selected group of children from the same kinds of family backgrounds as the termites and dispensed with IQs altogether, he would have ended up with a group doing almost as many impressive things as his painstakingly selected group of geniuses. By no stretch of the imagination or of standards of genius, Sorokin concluded, is the gifted group as a whole gifted. By the time Terman came out with his fourth volume of Genetic Studies of Genius, the word genius had all but vanished. We have seen, Terman concluded, with more than a touch of disappointment, that intellect and achievement are far from perfectly correlated. What I told you at the beginning of this chapter about the extraordinary intelligence of Chris Langan, in other words, is of little use if we want to understand his chances of being a success in the world. Yes, he is a man with a one in a million mind and the ability to get through Principia Mathematica at 16. And yes, his sentences come marching out one after another, polished and crisp like soldiers on a parade ground. But so what? If we want to understand the likelihood of his becoming a true outlier, we have to know a lot more about him than that.